Please be seated. I believe for, we're back on the record, I believe for the purposes of the jury, I have to have the state um, rest because of, effectively there was one rebuttal witness. So they need to know that the state is rested and then I'll give the closing argument instruction. Yes. when we bring the jury in if the state will rest on the record and I'll give the closing argument instruction and then you may proceed we will take a recess an hour into your argument <coughs> are we ready to bring the jury in defense ready okay thank you let's go ahead and bring them in
please be seated. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Welcome back. And as you're getting settled in with your notes, I'm going to ask you my questions. If your yes, answer is yes to any of my questions, please raise your hand. During the overnight recess, did any of you have any discussions amongst yourselves or with anybody else about the case? No, no hands are being raised. Did any of you read or listen to any emails, text messages, Twitters? Tweets, social networking pages, or blogs about the case? No. no hands are being raised. Did any of you use any type of an, um, device to get on the internet to do independent research about the case, people, places, things, or terminology? No, no hands are being raised. And finally, did um, any of you read or create, or I already asked you that one. Never mind. It's been a long morning. Okay, um, Mr. De La Le Rionda, the state rests? Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> this time we're announced to rest. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, both the state and the defendant have rested their cases. The attorneys will now present their final arguments. Please remember that what the attorneys say is not evidence or your instruction on the law. However, do listen closely to their arguments. They are intended to aid you in understanding the case. Each side will have equal time, but the state is, in is entitled to divide this time between an opening argument and a rebuttal argument after the defense has spoken. And just so we know, Mr. De, Lo De La Rionda will let us know when would be a good breaking time for a, a recess during his argument. So we will take a brief recess um, in the middle. And you'll just let us know when. You may proceed. Hey, please support counsel. Good afternoon. A teenager is dead. He is dead through no fault of his own. He is dead because another man made assumptions. That man assumed certain things. He is dead not just because the man made those assumptions, because he acted upon those assumptions. And unfortunately, unfortunately, because his assumptions were wrong, Trayvon Benjamin Martin no longer walks on this earth. The defendant in this case, George Zimmerman, acted upon those assumptions. And because of that, a young man, a 17-year-old man, a barely 17-year-old man, I think he was three weeks past his birthday, is dead. Unfortunately, This is one of the last photos that will ever be taken of Trayvon Martin. And that is true because of the actions of one individual, the man before you, the defendant, George Zimmerman. A man who, after shooting Trayvon Martin, claims to not have realized that he was dead. And what did he do? Do you recall what the testimony was about what he did after? Did he render or attempt to render the same aid that those heroic officers from the Sanford Police Department did? who didn't wear the mask that they normally would wear, but gave mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, performed CPR in an attempt to bring life back into that young boy? Did he do that? Recall also what happened when Mr. Manalo came out. And recall also what happened when the officer came out and that they handcuffed him 
And recall what he told Mr. Manalo, please call my wife. And then apparently Mr. Manalo was taking too long or something. And he said, just tell her I killed her. Just kind of matter of fact. Those acts, those actions speak volumes of what occurred that evening, Sunday evening. And they speak volumes of this defendant's actions. Sunday, February 27th, sorry, February 26th, 2012, at 7.09 p.m at the retreat of Twin Lakes townhomes. Now, you're obviously aware that the shooting actually happened minutes later. In fact, I think because of the recording that was made, we were actually able to precisely determine when that fatal shot occurred. And it occurred at 7, 16, and 55 seconds. But I would submit that the events leading up to this murder actually occurred not just earlier that Sunday evening, but months before. And why do I say that? Even though Trayvon Martin wasn't there months before, why do I say that the events leading up to this occurred months before? <clears throat> You recall the testimony of several people, but most importantly, the evidence you heard from this defendant's mouth when he was being interviewed by Investigator Singleton. When she first said something to the effect of, well, tell me what happened out there. I wasn't out there. I haven't gone to the scene. And what did he first say? Nine, five, six. This is the correct one? Okay. So you live at 1950 Retreat View Circle. Okay. I'm just going to keep quiet and you would, you tell me the story. You tell me what happened tonight. Okay? Okay. Just tonight? Yeah, what, or whatever led up to this. Anything you want to tell me about what happened and why it ended up, what it ended up to, to um, where this, this, this boy got shot. This. Okay. The neighborhood has had a lot of crimes. Um, my wife saw our neighbors get broken into and she got scared. Are you talking about the residents or vehicles? The residents. Okay. While it was occupied. Um, so I decided to start a neighborhood watch program in my neighborhood. Okay, um, what is the name of the neighborhood? Retreat of Twin Lakes. Now, those actions weren't anything sinister or terrible or evil or of ill will. Those were actions that occur throughout the United States in many cities, unfortunately, where crimes occur in a neighborhood and people get together and form neighborhood watches or other associations to deal with it. There's nothing sinister or wrong with that. But in this particular case, it led to the death of an innocent 17-year-old boy. Because this defendant made the wrong assumption. He profiled him as a criminal. He assumed certain things. That Trayvon Martin was up to no good. And that is what led to his death. Trayvon Martin, he was staying, he was there legally. He hadn't broken in or sneaked in or trespassed. He was there legally. He went to the 7-Eleven store earlier that evening. He bought what? What did he buy? What was his crime? He bought Skittles and some kind of watermelon or iced tea or whatever it's called. That was his crime.
He had $40 and 15 cents in his pockets. He was wearing a photo button and he was speaking to a girl in Miami. He was minding his own business. But apparently, this defendant decided that he was up to no good, that the victim was up to no good. What had Trayvon Martin planned for that evening? To watch a basketball game with his younger, I guess you'd call him stepbrother or friend, the son of his father's fiance. That's where he was headed back home. You know, this wasn't at two o'clock in the morning or partying somewhere, not that that would in any way minimize it, but he wasn't, he was just doing a normal everyday thing. He went to the store, got something, got some Skittles and some tea or drink, and was just walking back. Now it was raining. He was wearing a hoodie. Last I heard, that's not against the law. But in this man's eyes, he was up to no good. He presumed something that was not true. Now, what's ironic about this, Neighborhood Watch, and you heard from Ms. Dorville, and you heard from officers, etc. Again, that's a respected thing that we encourage citizens to do. But in this particular case, he didn't even bother to find out if he thought he was up to no good. He called the, he called the police, the non-emergency number, but then he followed him. He tracked him. Because in his mind, in the defendant's mind, this was a criminal. And he was tired of criminals committing crimes out there. Again, that's not a bad thing. It's good that citizens get involved. But he went over the line. He assumed things that weren't true. And instead of waiting for the police, instead of waiting for the police to come and do their job, he did not. Because he, the defendant, wanted to make sure that Trayvon Martin didn't get out of the neighborhood. You might recall the prior testimony about the prior incidents. What happened? They would commit some kind of crime, apparently, and they would all flee. By the time, I think there was one guy that was caught, but the rest of them would flee. And this defendant was sick and tired of it. So that night, he decided he, wanted, he, he was going to be what he wanted to be, a police officer. Now, police officers are trained. Recall one of the questions that was asked of Investigator Serino by the defense. Sir, if you were driving by and somebody was in the front yard and maybe looking through a window, would you, wouldn't you stop at your car and kind of investigate that? He, his first, my re recollection, is that his comment was, his answer was, I would think maybe he lives there. But see, in this defendant's mind, because of the prior crime out there, he automatically assumed that Trayvon Martin was a criminal. And that's why we're here. That is why we're here. Because the defense is going to argue to you that this was self-defense. And they're going to say, what actually happened at the time of the shooting? And I'm going to talk about that, obviously. But you can't just take that in a vacuum. It's not like this defendant was just walking home and some guy came out of nowhere and just started beating him up. I mean, when you think of it, when you really honestly think about it, who was more scared? The guy, the kid, that was minding his own business and going home, that was being followed by another guy in a, in a truck, in an SUV, and that kept following him. Recall what he told Rachel Gentile? This guy was following him, and she said something to the effect of, well, maybe he's like a sex pervert or something. And that's when he referred to, he's a cracker, whatever words he used, and he used the N-word too. But when you think of it, that is the person that was scared, I would submit. Now, Trayvon Martin, unfortunately, can't come into this courtroom 
and tell you how he was feeling. And that's true because of the actions of one man, the defendant. Let's talk about the defendant that night. No dispute that he lived there at Retreat of Twin Lakes. No dispute that he was part. I would submit he was, he was the neighborhood watch. But again, that's perfectly good. That's a good thing. But he was upset that burglars got away. That's also a good thing. That's good that people get involved. And apparently, according to his statement, he was driving a target. Now, he's driving a target. It's raining. And what does he do? Okay, he calls the police some suspicious. But then he tracks this guy down. He tracks Trayvon Martin. He doesn't just call the police and, okay, stay in your car. He keeps following him. And then he goes even further. He gets out of the car. So he sees the victim, he's suspicious of the victim, and then he calls 911, not emergency. Now, all those actions, no crime's been committed there. There's no crime right there. But it's important to realize this is what led to Trayvon Martin being dead. The defendant. 28 years old, 5 foot 7, 204 pounds, and armed. Now let me stop right here. He had the right to bear arms. We live in this great country, and the Second Amendment allows people to carry a firearm. And he had a permit. He had a right to have a concealed permit, to have a concealed firearm. So again, he is not violating any law. The victim in this case. 17 years old, 5 foot 11, 158 pounds. And he was unarmed. Well, I guess if you would consider Skittles or the tea or what, I'm not trying to make light of it, but the defense is saying, oh, it's that concrete, you know, like, and we'll talk about the concrete. But what started this? Assumptions incorrect assumptions on the part of one individual. And again, that's the last photograph we have of Trayvon Martin. This innocent 17-year-old kid was profiled as a criminal. To quote the defendant, and pardon my language, he was one of those assholes that get away. Pardon my language. He was one of those fucking punks. Now, the defendant, Mr. Zimmer, didn't scream that out, and so the defense will argue, well, that shows that he didn't have any ill will or hatred. No, I would submit to you that he uttered it under his breath. And that itself indicates ill will and hatred. Because he was speaking to the 911 or non-emergency person. But what he was doing is he was verbalizing what he was thinking. And that's why that's important. Because in his mind, he already assumed certain things. That Trayvon Martin was a fucking punk, and he was an asshole, and he wasn't going to get away this time. You recall the prior calls? We brought in five, I think defense put in another one, six, within the last five, six months, where crimes have been committed in the neighborhood. He was sick and tired of it. But the law doesn't say, okay, you know, take the law into your own hands. Oh, I'm sorry, I got the wrong guy. Oh. I'm so sorry, I thought he was a criminal. Mr. Martin, Tracy Martin, Sabrina Fulton, I am so sorry, I made a mistake. I didn't realize that Trayvon Martin was up to, was, was minding his own business. I am terribly sorry. You know, the law doesn't say that. The law talks about accountability and responsibility for one's actions. And that's what we're asking for in this case. Hold the defendant responsible for his actions. 
hold him accountable for what he did. Because if the defendant hadn't assumed that, Trayvon Martin would have watched the basketball game. George Zimmerman, I'm assuming, would have gone to Target and did whatever he does on Sunday evenings, and we wouldn't be here. The law doesn't allow people to take the law into their own hands. It doesn't allow, quite frankly, even the police to take the law into their own hands. The police had gotten called out there. They would have done. They, they would have, okay, are you, what are you doing here? Can I ask you what you're doing? Do you mind telling me? And under the law, they're allowed to ask somebody who's walking the streets. The person can ignore them or not. That's not a crime. Most people say, listen, I, I live right, I'm right here. I'm going home. You know, you want to come? But this defendant didn't give Trayvon Martin a chance. Recall the testimony of this defendant in terms of the interviews. And I'm going to play certain parts for you. But recall how he says that at one point that Trayvon Martin is circling his car. And my point in saying that is, number one, you've got to determine whether that's true. But let's presume that part is true. And he says he's got something in his hands. Why does this defendant get out of the car if he thinks that Trayvon Martin is a threat to him? Why? Why? Because he's got a gun. He's got the equalizer. He's going to take care of it. He's a wannabe cop. He's going to take care of it. He's got a gun. And my God, it's his community. And he's not going to put up with it. And if the police are taking too long to respond, he's going to handle it. Now, did he go over there and say, I'm going to kill this kid? No. This isn't first degree murder. It's not premeditated. But his actions resulted in the death of a 17-year-old boy. Did they not? I mean, do you have an innocent man before you? Is it really self-defense when you follow somebody? First of all, when you profile somebody incorrectly, when you automatically label him a criminal because he's acting in your mind, and in his mind, excuse me, as suspicious, because he's wearing a hoodie, because it's raining and he's walking the streets or not walking fast enough. I thought in this great country, no matter how stupid we might think somebody's acting because it's raining and he's walking or doing whatever, that that's not against the law. He did have his hoodie on. It was raining off and on. What's ironic in this case, and what I want to spend some time talking with you about, is the defendant's statements. Because you might think, well, hold on. You're the state. What are you putting on his self-serving statements when he's denying committing a crime, when he's saying it's self-defense? We wanted to tell you all the evidence. We wanted to put in all the witnesses that saw something of value out there. Because we wanted you to get the truth. We wanted you to get the complete story. But in doing so, I want to analyze, dissect with you the defense statements. Why was it necessary for the defendant to exaggerate everything that happened? Why was it that it took him a while, even at the very end, he kept denying something? What? Obviously, he kept denying that he intentionally killed him, that it was, you know, he said self-defense. But what was important even before that? What did he keep denying? That he followed him. Because the defendant knew that if he admitted he followed him, then that showed that ill will hatred. That put him in that category, uh, pardon my language, a fucking punk, an asshole. And that's what we have here, ladies and gentlemen. That's why he kept talking about, oh, I didn't know the name of the street. I, I was looking for an address. Remember that video, and I'm going to show it to you again, the part where he's walking, he goes to the, to the detectives, like, like the investigators, like there's some fools or something. Look. This is the back of the houses here. There's no addresses. Well, right in front of them is an, is an address. And by the way, there's only three streets. How difficult can it be? And he's the neighborhood watch guy. He's been living there four years. And he takes his dog down to that dog walk. But he doesn't know the names of the street. He doesn't know the main street that you go in. Because, see, when he admits something like that, 
then it proves one thing, that he was following him. That he had profiled him and he was following him. And that shows his guilt. Because it shows that his actions led, unfortunately, to the death of Trayvon Martin. So you can't just say, okay, what happened at the actual interaction between them? And again, we're going to talk about that. Because unfortunately, and I stress unfortunately, there's only one person, well, there's two people, one person's not with us anymore, but there's only two really people who knew what really happened out there. And he, the defendant, made sure that other person couldn't come into this courtroom and tell you what happened. He, the defendant, silenced Trayvon Martin. But I would submit to you, even in silence, his body provides evidence as to this defendant's guilt. And why do I say that? Because from DNA, from lack of blood, other stuff, his body speaks to you. And even in death, that, and it proves to you that this defendant is lying about what happened. Do you recall one of the things we talked about at some point with one of the witnesses, I think it was Dr. DeMaio, you know, a very impressive, distinguished doctor about this photograph the defendant, defense keeps parading. Recall what I did? I said, what do you expect? Blood. And I'm going to show you the photographs. Not just at the medical examiners because they're saying, oh, that Dr. Bao, he's incompetent, he didn't know what he was doing. No, I'm going to show you the photographs at the scene, which show what? No blood in his hands. Now they're going to say, oh, it was raining that night. Wow. And I guess the blood on the defendant's head just stuck there, right? But on the victim, it just kind of vanished? Can't have it both, can't have it like that. See, because what's important is the defendant in an attempt to convince the police that he was really shooting this man, this boy, in self-defense, he had to exaggerate what happened. That's why he had to at some point say, oh, he was threatening me. It was almost like the levels of fear ex escalated. And we'll talk about that. How he was then, originally he hit him, and then he got him on the ground, and then there was a struggle. And then he got the upper hand. And then, um, let's see, it got worse. And then he threatened to kill him. And then he put his hand over his mouth, suffocating him, and then he pinched his nose. And then he went for the gun. See how he's, he's exaggerating everything? Oh, you don't believe this stuff? Hold on, it was even more dangerous. Because you know why? This defendant, as you heard, has studied the law in terms of what's required for self-defense. And he's got all those bullet points in terms of what's required. So if you take one word out of here, that I would submit to you shows this defendant's guilt, it's assumptions on the part of the defendant. The defendant assumed that the victim didn't belong at the retreat of Twin Lakes, didn't he? That the victim was committing or about to commit a burglary. He assumed and he profiled the victim as a criminal. He assumed that the victim was one of those uh, that always got away. He assumed also that he was an effing punk. And that the victim was going to get away before the police arrived. Now, what didn't the defendant do? Let's assume he was assuming that. And again, assuming something is not against the law by itself. Unless you want. Well, let's assume at that time he legitimately thought that Trayvon Martin might be committing a crime. Okay, he called the police, non emergency number. It's a good thing. But what did he do? He didn't, you know, when this victim is coming up to him and like cir he claims circling his car, like, like, what are you doing, man? What are you following me for? He didn't say, hold on, I'm sorry, I'm with the neighborhood watch. Or do you, you know, can I assist you in some way? You look lost, or you look like you don't know what's going on. Can I help you? Can I give you a ride? Or let's say he was scared of him, but he could have said, do you live around here? Can I call the police? Can I call a friend? He didn't do that. He didn't take any action 
because he already in his mind had assumed that he was a criminal and he wasn't going to give him any benefit of the doubt. He rolled down the window and identified himself as a neighborhood watch. Just say, listen, I've called the police. I'm not a bad guy. I'm not a pervert. I'm not following you for anything, whatever your name is. But you mind waiting? The police are on the way. They're going to be here in about 30 seconds or a minute. Sometimes they take a little bit longer. But would you mind waiting here? I'm a little suspicious of what you're doing. Would you mind waiting? He didn't do that. Did he wait for the police? No. Did he wait inside his car? No. Did he let the victim know he wasn't a weirdo? No. So let's talk about weighing the evidence in terms of what the instructions the court will give you an opportunity to see and know. Were the answers that the witness gave straightforward? Did anybody have an interest in the outcome? And did the evidence agree with the other evidence? Are there prior inconsistent statements? And again, use your God-given common sense. What do we have here? Really, what does it boil down to? You heard a little bit, and we put evidence of the fact that the defendant at one point wanted to be a police officer. I mean, I've been in law enforcement 30 years, prosecutor. There's nothing wrong. That's a good thing. We ought to encourage people to be police officers. That's an honorable profession. He applied in Virginia, didn't get in, and then he's doing other stuff. He's taking criminal justice credits. That's good. But again, it doesn't say that the law allows a person to take the, the matters into their own hand. If not, why are we here? I mean, let's, why do we have courtrooms? Why do we have jurors? Let's just let people handle it outside. Oh, they're wrong? Well, you know, sorry. So I want to talk about the witnesses. And before I do that, I want to take a moment to uh, thank you for your time and service. I think we started over four weeks ago in, in this process that we're all so fortunate to, to be able to, to live in, you know, live the Constitution in terms of asking people to come from their everyday lives and give up a lot at, from work and from family to serve as jurors. So I think I, I speak on behalf of everybody, the defense, the court, and everybody. We thank you for your time and your patience. This case is very important to the state of Florida. It's important to the victim's family. It's important to the defendant. And it's also important, obviously, to you. You probably realized that as you all are watching the juror, I'm sorry, the witnesses, and watching the trial, periodically the attorneys will watch you, and, and the court will. And you guys were very attentive. Some took more notes than others. But Without a doubt, nobody was falling asleep. And you know, it's a long process. You've been here a long time, and we're towards the end. But I want to take a few moments and talk about what I would submit is how you arrive at a verdict. You know, we ask in this great country for people to serve as jurors without really any legal experience. In a lot of countries, they don't have. They have lawyers or judges that are already automatically plugged in as such and that's what they do they have professional people that sit as jurors we ask people to come from their everyday lives and sit as jurors that's what i would submit makes this country great so how is it that if you're asked to come and you really don't have any legal experience how do you arrive at a verdict that speaks the truth how do you arrive at a verdict that is just i would submit to you do three things Number one, you rely, obviously, on the witnesses, the testimony, the evidence that you'll have, the physical evidence that you saw, and you'll be able to digest more if you want to, the recordings, all that other stuff. Number two, you rely on the law that Judge Nelson will read to you, and you'll actually be provided a copy of. And number three, and perhaps most importantly, you rely on your God-given common sense. You know, that common sense that we just kind of use automatically without even having to think about it to make decisions at home and at work, 
the law encourages you to do that in evaluating the evidence, determining what's valid, what's not, and what makes sense. And when you do those three things, when you rely on the witness's testimony, the physical evidence, and other stuff, when you rely on the law, and then when you rely and apply your common sense to you, I would submit to you, you come back with a verdict that speaks the truth, a verdict that is just. And that verdict would be that this defendant is guilty of murder in the second degree. I mean, do you believe that there is an innocent man sitting over there right now? Do you believe that he just assumed something, but he kind of overreacted a little bit, but you know, it really wasn't his fault that Trayvon Martin is dead? Do you believe that this was just kind of a struggle or an argument or a discussion or a fight that just kind of got out of hand? Perhaps, but who started this? Who followed who? Who was minding their own business? And again, of the two, who was the one that was armed? And who knew that they were armed? I hope you can see that from there. We, uh, and I've got it right here too. Um, it's a timeline and it's gonna kind of tell you a little bit about what happened there. It's a timeline showing the phone call and you'll be able to take it back there, it's in evidence. But it's a timeline showing the phone call between Rachel Gentel and Trayvon Martin. There's two parts to it and it's color coded. Hopefully we've made it fancy so you all can, can uh, decipher it. You know, I'm old and I'm getting used to now the computer systems, but hopefully it makes sense. And what you also have is you also have George Zimmerman's call, so you have the exact time from, in terms of the length of the call. Then you also have it broke up originally with, as you recall, Ms. Gentel talked about that she lost contact and then she got it back up. And then you have Ms. Lauer's call. And that's why I was able to tell you unequivocally as to when the gunshot occurred. Because we were able to time when Ms. Lauer made the call and you hear the gunshot, unfortunately, in that call. And then you have other calls too, Ms. Serdaika that you heard speak. And then you have when Officer Smith arrived at the, at the retreat between lakes and you have Mr. Good's call. So I would submit to you that's relevant in terms of establishing the timeline as best we can as to what occurred. Now, are people off, you know, by a few minutes possibly, but the phone records don't, don't lie because my recollection was that we spent, I think, half a day one day and possibly half a day the next day hearing from one witness. Her name was Rachel Gentel. Now, this young lady, I will submit to you, is not a very sophisticated person. She's not the most educated, but she's a human being and she spoke as best she could. You know, she happens to be what? Haitian or of Haitian descent. And, you know, made a big deal about, oh, you can't read cursive. Yes, yeah, you can, unfortunately. She's what, 18, 19? <coughs> but, did what she tell you as best she could, and maybe her English wasn't the best, maybe her speech, her language was a little colorful. I think she referred to me as that bald-headed dude and referred to other phrases to describe other people. But did she speak the truth? Because when you think of it, she was the person that was speaking to the victim. And really, the conversation that she had with the victim, nobody would know whether she's telling the truth or not other than her. I mean, we have the phone records that established it, that there's no dispute that they were talking. But what I'm saying is, she didn't have to, she could have embellished, she could have lied about what the victim said and when she referred to the guy that was following him, that creepy guy, when she said to him, he's probably a pervert or a sexual something, why is this guy following you? And Trey Vaughn Martin said he's what a white ass, whatever, cracker, or whatever. She didn't color it. Yeah, when she talked to the victim's mother, she didn't use that language. But she didn't come in here and lie to you about that. I mean, she could have, and nobody would have known the difference. It wasn't like her conversation was being recorded. But see, 
Her use of colorful language doesn't mean that her testimony is less credible just because she's not a highly educated individual. Again, we have records that establish that that conversation took place. So there's no dispute about that. And those records are up there. But let's talk about she spent hours on that witness stand. Why? I guess attempt to discredit her in some way? You decide whether she was telling the truth. Do you disregard what she said because her family's from Haiti? Because she isn't sophisticated? And she, because she can't read cursive, unfortunately? I mean, is that what you, should, what you should do? I don't think the instructions are going to tell you that, but you could decide. Well, she's not very educated. I don't think she's... And I'm not saying that you will. But, I mean, why do we take so long in asking her questions? Because we're trying to get to the truth, both sides. But I think the other witnesses, I guess, were maybe more sophisticated. They didn't, it didn't take six hours or whatever. Anyway, you decide. But did what she say comport or match up with the evidence that the other people were talking? I would submit it, it did. I mean, think back, and it happened a while ago, but think about what she said. What she said Trayvon Martin said, and isn't it consistent with the evidence? I mean, is there any dispute that this defendant profiled, it's my word, you can use whatever your word you want to use, but isn't it true that this defendant assumed that Trayvon Martin was a criminal? I mean, he even tells the police that. Why is, isn't that consistent with what Rachel Gentile tells you? Didn't even the defendant in his statements to the police say, yeah, the kid or however he referred to him, the guy, whatever, he's running away. Didn't she say that? I had a dream that today a witness would be judged not on the color of her personality, but of the content of her testimony. On the content of her testimony. Just because she's got a colorful personality, just because she referred to me as a bald-headed dude or whatever, that doesn't mean her story, her statements aren't accurate. Was the evidence consistent with what she said? <coughs> Wasn't she on the telephone with the victim? Isn't it true the defendant was following the victim? Didn't the victim attempt to get away? Didn't the defendant confront the victim? I don't think the defense will admit that. The defendant and the police didn't admit that. But what did he say? Oh, I was just looking for an address. Oh, I was just looking for the street. Oh, you were minding your own business and all of a sudden this victim that you were following just decided to all of a sudden attack you out of nowhere. In fact, she went a little further, I will submit. She warned the victim that maybe he was a sexual pervert. And again, some colorful words were used by her to describe the defendant in terms of what the victim had described the defendant as. I would submit to you that that's an example that she's telling the truth. Now, she did lie about funeral and about her age originally to the police, to me, to the mother. Why? Okay, she's guilty of that. She didn't want to go have to see the body. She didn't want to deal with it. And she lied to the mother of Trayvon Martin. So you could disregard her testimony because of that. She lied about her age because she didn't want to come forward. <coughs> Maybe she realized that she might have to testify and people would find out that she can't read cursive. Unfortunately. We have the defendant's non-emergency call. No dispute about that. That's recorded. I believe there might be a dispute as to whether the operator 
told him not to follow or not. You decide. What was in that recording? Okay. These assholes, they always get away. Why was it necessary to say that under his breath? Doesn't that kind of show, demonstrate what the defendant was feeling at the time? I mean, that wasn't information that he was providing to the operator, like, okay, he is a, pardon my language, an asshole. So when the officer comes, he can go, pardon my language, asshole, asshole, where are you? That wasn't a description so that the officer could identify him, was it? Why is he uttering that, that word? Other than that's how he feels. Now, defense may get up here and tell you, oh, he was just angry. Well, you decide. I would submit to you on behalf of the state of Florida, that's more than a little angry. That's frustration. That's kind of ill will, hatred, that you've made up your mind he's a criminal and you're tired of these criminals committing crimes and my God, he's not going to get away. Are you following him? Yeah. Okay, we don't need you to do that. Why was it necessary to again utter the words effing punk? If he hadn't already in his mind determined that he was a criminal, that Trayvon Martin was a criminal and he was not going to get away. Recall the testimony in terms of the entrance. And again, we talked about the fact that there's only three streets. This is one. This is the one that circles all the way around, and then there's another one. But of course, he claims to not know the street that he comes in and every day, in and out, Twin Tree Lane, right here. He claims to not know that street. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to show you. In that interview, with one of the interviews with the, with the detective, in the car, Leading up to it, he makes reference to the street name. And then, like, a minute later, he's talking about, I don't know the name of the street. He inadvertently let out that he was aware of that street. Because he let out that that was a lie that he told the police so that it would justify why he is following, why he is profiling, why he is tracking a young man. And again, that's just a close up of where this happened right here. You obviously are very well familiar with it, and we've got some more exhibits for that. We have Ms. Lauer's call, the 911 call. And really, Ms. Lauer, what did she say? She didn't see anything. She stayed inside. I think at some point in that phone call, she's telling her husband, to be, I think they, they're married now, um, Jeremy Weinberg. Um, Jeremy, get, you know, get away from the window or do something. Don't go out there. But the bottom line is she recorded it. But what did she say? Before the actual recording, before she called the police, she heard something going on out there. Because, see, this wasn't like the defendant claims that out of the blue, the victim just kind of attacked him and knocked him to the ground and they just started beating him. No, this started, I would submit, further down, but it didn't start right at the T where the defendant claims it occurred. Mr. Dyka, you heard from her too. And we've got the vantage point in terms of there, where her, her place was. My recollection was she's got a um, cat, I think his name was Leo who's got a ledge there, and she was kind of looking out, and she was reading at some point. She got up, she looked. She had a good vantage point. She did observe something. And what did she tell you? That in her opinion, based on what she saw, she thought the bigger man was on top. And she told you that the voice she heard, she thought was of a child versus an older person. 
Now, is she an expert? Had she ever heard these voices before? No. She's just telling you what she believes. Just like you've had a bunch of other people come in and say, oh, that is George Zerman's voice, and that is Trayvon Martin's voice. You decide. But she told you as best she could what she observed. And what's consistent in terms of what she observed and what happened? Because, see, the issue is, at that time, when there was contact between the defendant and the victim, did it occur as the defendant claims? First of all, you'd have to believe that he really wasn't following him, and he was just kind of minding his own business. He was going out for a walk. His walk got interrupted because some guy attacked him. You've got to believe that. You've got to believe he wasn't following anybody. He wasn't up to doing anything. He was just kind of minding his own business, and as he was walking back, the victim, for some reason, just decided to go attack him. So you've got to have that assumption. It's got to be accurate. And then you've got to assume that then the victim just hit him and knocked him to the ground and just started beating him. And, and poor defendant, poor George Zierman, he just kind of took it, boom, boom, just getting whacked over and over. He never did anything. Compare the sizes. And then, oh, at the last moment, he was able to take out that gun, his concealed gun, and was able just to just shoot him. You have the testimony of John Good, who did call 911, and the time frame is important in terms of when his call was made. I think in, in, in opening statements, the defense told you that represented to you that he is the eyewitness. He is the crucial eyewitness. He's the only eyewitness. I'll beg to differ, but again, it's what's important is what you think. Let's talk a little bit about John Good. What did John Good tell you? He saw what he believed was the victim on top of the defendant. Now, he did not see the shooting. He saw prior to the shooting. I would submit to you when you kind of put all the witnesses together, that there wasn't just like the defendant knocking the victim down to the ground and then just staying on top of him and beating the hell out of him. I would submit to you that there was contact between them, that there was a fight, there was a struggle. Ironically, of the two, one of the individuals is the one that's had, what, 18 months MMA fighting? Oh, but of course he's just a pudgy, uh, overweight man, is I think what uh, Mr. Pollock said. He really didn't progress beyond the first level, but he's the one that's had MMA training of some type. But anyway, they interacted, they rolled around, and they fought. But again, you can't just take that in a vacuum. Why did this occur? What led up to this? And at the time of the shooting, was it necessary to shoot him? Well, the defense is going to parade the photographs of the injuries. I don't think I need to show you the one photo that counts, do I? The ME photo. Who suffered the most serious injury of all? You heard from Ms. Bahador. What did she tell you? Oh, I apologize. Mr. Good. He said that he saw a struggle out there. He saw the victim, who he believes was the victim, based on clothing description. He didn't know him, on top of the defendant. And he saw the victims doing something to the defendant. He originally said it was MMA style. But when asked specifically, did you actually see blows, he said, no. I saw movement there. He may have been hitting him, but I don't know. What's also very important about what Mr. Good told you? He told you that he could not see the defendant's hands. So did the defendant have the gun out at that point? Was he trying to get it out? And was Trayvon Martin at that point, which is about, what, 25, 30 seconds or so before the shooting, was he trying to protect himself from that gun? Is that what the struggle was about? 
that at some point this defendant had the gun? Defendant claims at the very end, right before, unfortunately, he had to shoot the victim, that the victim grabbed the gun. Unfortunately for him, the truth comes out, and it refutes what the defendant says. Recall the testimony of Mr. Gorgone in terms of the DNA? There wasn't any on the gun. Recall what he told his best friend, Mr. Osterman, what the defendant told Mr. Osterman, not like a month later, that same evening, meaning the morning after, when he picked him up at the police station and drove him to his house, that he, the victim had grabbed the gun. Not the holster, grabbed the gun. <clears throat> Excuse me, in fact, Mr. Osman told you he wrote a book about it with his wife. Ms. Bahador told you that she heard something out there. I think it was either Ms. Bahador or Ms. Serdaka heard something like no, I think that kind of matches up with what uh, Rachel Gentel told you about, like, get off of me or something to that effect. Again, you all took great notes. I'm sure you paid attention to when the witnesses were out there. So I'm not going to cover every little minor point, but it's consistent with what Rachel Gentel told you. And she described, my recollection was that she described she lives right here at 2841. She described movement this way. Was the victim headed home, as Miss Gentel told you? And I need to show you the bigger diagram, because you know what's ironic? Is, recall, even the defendants from the defendant's own mouth, that they always got away in this exit over here, the other exit, and the victim, you might recall, was staying right here. Was he headed there and did the defendant kind of cut him off? But it's consistent with what Ms. Bahador told you in terms of from her back, left to right. And what did she see? She saw them struggling. That is, the defendant and the victim struggling upright. Defendant claims that Trayvon Martin is the strongest guy in the world because he grabbed him, picked him up, and then transported him, what, 20 yards, 30? You, you saw the pictures, and I'll talk about the diagram, but he claims that he pushed them, you know, or pulled them all the way over here. Recall where all the items are in connection to where the victim ended up? The Manalos. Mrs. and Mr. Manala talk to you about what they observed, or what they really didn't observe. My recollection is Ms. Manalo said that the bigger person was on top. They made a big issue, the defense and cross-examining her, hold on, but you did see some photographs on TV, and the photographs you saw were of Trayvon Martin and showed him playing football in the, you know, like a football uniform. Yeah, that's true. But I still think the person on top was the bigger person. Now, she didn't see the shooting. My point is that there was a fight there. There was a struggle, and at some points it appears, based on the evidence, that the defendant was on top, and at some points the victim was on top. It's wrestling, struggling, whatever you want to call it. But why did it occur? Why did it occur? If you believe he's an innocent man, then you believe that the victim just decided to come up and just smack him. Smacked the defendant, and the defendant fell to the ground, and the victim just started beating him up for, oh, we don't know, but for some reason. And that the defendant really wasn't following him. The defendant really was just kind of walking back to his car. The defendant was truthful when he was telling the police that he was just kind of trying to find out what the address was, or he was trying to find out what that street name was. And, and I apologize, Mr. Manalo told you that he went outside within seconds, I think it was like 20, 30 seconds, and when he stepped outside, he observed a defendant, and he said he thought the defendant was beaten up. He said the defendant was doing something, acting, and then he said he asked him about the phone and talking about calling his wife. 
And that's when he made that remark, just tell her I, I killed him or I shot him. Now you might be thinking, well, hold on, if there was a fight, if there was a struggle, what, how does that factor in? Well, and who started it? Who was following who? Who was chasing who? Who had the right if they were being chased? Does the defendant have the right to self-defense? I'm sorry, does the victim? When he's being chased by this person? It's, it's, you'll, you'll hear the facts in this case, and you'll hear in terms of whether the defendant was chasing him or not. You know, it was dark out there. There's no dispute about that. It was raining. No dispute about that. And that's what these photographs show. It shows the distance from one, uh, the sidewalk or dog walk to where the body was. It shows where several items were. And you've got the diagrams and you've got the photographs. One thing I would submit that these photographs show is the absence of blood on that sidewalk. The other big thing is if the defendant was really having his head bashed in as the, he claims to the police, and he has some injuries to the back of his head, and we'll talk about that, but I think there were, what, centimeters or less? Why isn't his jacket all torn up or at least scratched up if he was being picked up over and over why is his jacket all right, the back of his jacket? You think about that? Or is he exaggerating what happened? Flashlight, that was with the key ring, and that was, uh, that's the one that was still on. Stage exhibit 10 showed another angle in terms of the evidence out there. In terms of there apparently was some slope, and we'll talk about the significance of that because based on what the defendant told the police. And again, this is showing stage exhibit 15, so the body was covered up. That's the other flashlight that the defendant had, and I think he's told the police that it stopped working or something. If you want to, check again his statements to the police. Was he carrying it in one hand? Why was he carrying it in one hand? Okay, I guess he took it out there to see, tracked down Trayvon Martin and then it just stopped working, so he didn't put it in his pocket. I guess he was carrying his hand. That's the victim's phone. There's no dispute that he was talking on the phone. And this is how, when they attempted to save his life, he was turned over. I show you this photograph, not to show you just that, but I show you that because I wanted you to focus on this. He was speaking on the phone, and he had ear plugs or whatever you call them. Stage exhibit 22 is a close-up of where the gunshot was, and also this photograph button. One thing I'd suggest to you that might be important to note on that is it was a big deal made about the jacket or the hoodie or the sweatshirt, how it, it had to be consistent with the can and how to do that. Well, that button might have something to do with the way that sweatshirt is kind of hanging. It's a little big on them, but also that might affect the angle of how much is sticking out of the sweatshirt. You decide. Stage exhibit 23, why is that important? Do you see any blood on his hands, on the victim's hands? Stage exhibit 24, do you see any blood on his hands? I mean, is there any dispute that the defendant's mouth, nose, I'm sorry, had some blood on it? How come there isn't any blood on the victim's hands? Because the argument was made or suggested to you in terms of the cross-examination of the medical examiner and all that. Oh, you had to wash his hands, so that wasn't accurate. You know, you all didn't know what you were doing there. Well. Right there at the scene, where was the blood? The other interesting thing is that I will submit to you, just based on the evidence, 
I don't know what you call this. I don't know if it's a drawstring or what. Why is one of them a lot longer than the other one? Was the defendant maybe pulling on that as the victim was trying to back out? It's ironic that you see how one is pulled all the way down? And which side is it on? Stage Exhibit 29 to show some of the other exhibits out there. Stage Exhibit 33, I put this in here because I thought, and we talked about it, I believe it came out during the testimony, that there's a street address right there. That's where the defendant claimed he didn't know A, the, the street name, or he couldn't find an address. Even though he's lived out there four years, he takes his dog out there, or dogs out there to walk, but he doesn't know that there's street addresses because this isn't just like some fancy or, or just regular neighborhood that all the houses are different. These are kind of cookie cutter. They're all the same. But he didn't know the address, there was addresses out there. So that's why he had to walk that long distance to find the address or find the street for the police to aid him. Stage exhibit 36, those are just some daytime photographs kind of showing you the area and in terms of what happened out there. Stage Exhibit 76, there's been a big issue about that photograph. It shows how he, the defendant was bleeding. I believe Mr. Manalo took that photograph. Why is the blood still on there, and why would the blood not be on the victim's hands? It's interesting, too, the direction of the blood, and we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of what happened. Stage Exhibit 77, this is, again, Mr. Manalo before the police got out there. Where are the victim's hands, but under his body? What did the defendant claim to you? He used police jargon in terms of suspect and, well, the police, of course, they always spread out the arms, the hands, to make sure there's no weapon there. Because he's trying to tell the police that what happens is he was scared, and he at one point said, oh, I thought I had, he had something in his hand, so I was checking for that weapon. That's what I was doing. Well, it's inconsistent with the physical evidence out there. Now, defense may argue, hold on, didn't Dr. DeMaio say that you could take out a person's heart and then they could live for 15 seconds and that the person could kind of walk or do all this other stuff? Okay, so you take out the heart, then the defendant kind of moves him and spreads out his hands, and so he's taking even more blood pumping out, and he's able, and then the, the victim just kind of happens to just kind of lift himself up and put the hands underneath? I don't know. You decide. Why did he have to say that? because it's part of him wanting to be a cop. And that's what police officers do. Even when they shoot somebody, they usually handcuff them. Even if the person is dead, I mean, they handcuff them just for security purposes. The other interesting thing is, that's, you recall the flashlight the defendant had in terms of in relation to where the body was. And again, the photograph that I showed you, State Exhibit 79, that was showing, I think, one or a few witnesses out there. And State Exhibit 80, those are the two photographs that were showing out there that was taken, I think, by Austin Wagner. Defendant's gun. Do you recall what we heard about that from an expert regarding DNA? Swap from the pistol grip matches the defendant. And Trayvon Mars excluded. That is inconsistent with what the defendant claimed to Mr. Osterman. He told the police he was going for the gun. He told Mr. Osterman that he had the gun or grabbed the, I think he described what part of the gun he grabbed. And then there's other test results not limited and then no determination made on the other side. In the holster. You had also, I would submit relevant, the fingernail scrapings of the victim in this case. What were the findings? No DNA foreign to Trayvon Martin, no DNA results at all. So the victim in this struggle that defendant claims he had with him when he was trying to kill him basically or sh shut him up so that he couldn't speak, where did all the blood go? Where did all the defendant's blood go? 
while we're on that subject, the defendant claims that he was the only one yelling out there. So all the cries for help were only him. You got to decide whether it was him or whether it was Trayvon Martin or whether it was both of them. It had to be one of them or both. But if he's yelling and if he's down and if he's got all this blood and he's swallowing the blood, how's he able to do all that? And why is there a consistent in terms of yells of help, help, help? Help. Why, why, why isn't it muffled down? Why, why is he able to yell if the defendant claims the victim was... How's he, how's he going to talk? Or is he lying about that? I would submit to you that's another lie. You saw that the uh, hooded jacket was checked, and I'm just giving you very quickly the DNA results. You've got an exhibit there that's got them all in there. But just to demonstrate to you how thorough the investigation was in terms of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement doing their thorough analysis of the case in terms of the evidence. Remember, we take a, I don't know how far we've gone. If you're ready, if you're ready to take a break, we'll take a 15 minute recess. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your notepads face down on the chair and follow Deputy Jarvis back into the jury room. Please be seated. Court will be in recess for 15 minutes.